Thanks, Josh, and thanks everybody for coming this afternoon. Um, I only have one slide because this was five minutes and I thought we could get much more color out of the Q&A. So um, I, in, a picture is worth a thousand words here. Someone called this a very Copernican view of, <coughs> uh, of uh, our business and I can understand why people would say that. But uh, I think it, it represents sort of the message that I want to put forward today which is certainly um, Bluebird has been a leader in gene therapy and in um, lentiviral manufacturing for many years. Uh, and, and I just want folks to understand that um, we are making significant investments in other areas of the company, both from a, a science and, and intellectual standpoint as well as from a financial standpoint. And really, our, our CAR-T program, which we'll, we've heard a little bit about today, and, and as well as our gene editing platform, these are things that we were in uh, very early, we did it for scientific reasons, not for valuation reasons. So um, back in 2013, we uh, formed a partnership with Celgene uh, for our CAR-T program. We're going to be in the clinic in uh, early 2016. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, although we haven't given a lot of specifics on targets. It's a crowded space. And also on gene editing, we bought this little gene editing company back in February and it was a curiosity for folks at the time and now we're seeing the promise that gene editing can deliver not only on the CAR-T side but certainly on the gene therapy side for, for future therapeutic indications as well as for second generations uh, of existing products in gene therapy and in CAR-T. So um, maybe with that, just to give folks a broad outline, we can talk more specifically about some of our milestones for the year. I'm sure Josh and I can talk about some of those, but um, you've heard some things about beta thalassemia back in December at ASH. I guess what I'd say there is that for the studies 204 and 205, which, is, which are beta thalassemia phase one, two trials, we're planning to complete enrollment by the end of the year. That's one of our uh, milestones that we've shared publicly. We want folks to know. Uh, also, we have a, a potentially a registration of phase two, phase three trial for our CCALD indication in adrenal leukodystrophy, and we plan to complete it, uh, our enrollment in that trial as well by the end of the year. And then specifically in CAR T, as I mentioned earlier, we will uh, be in the clinic by early 2016. We're not saying too much more about it right now than that, but um, it, it's an important part of uh, what we're doing internally, and we certainly have great leaders like Rick, who was participated in the panel earlier, um, thought leaders who are, who are developing the program for us. So with that, maybe I'll start the question and answer portion. Yeah, great. Um, maybe we'll, we'll start off by, by asking you to flush out a little bit more the, uh, the news flow for this year. Investors are super excited for lentiglobin and, and what we're seeing in, uh, in beta thalassemia. We're starting to get very excited about what we could see in sickle cell anemia. So just take us through the North Star and the 205 trials, sure. you know, a description of each one and, and how the, those will report data over the year. Sure. Uh, as best I can, I'll, I will uh, <laughs> provide as much information as I can. So for the 204, which is the North Star study, that's a U.S.-based study. And uh, e even that's about 15 patients at the current time, and uh, as I said, we'll enroll by the end of the year. Um, in terms of the 205 study, that's a, a French-based study. That includes one sickle cell patient, which at the time when we released data at ASH in December, uh, only had about one month worth of treatment, so there was no, uh, so no data, so I think people are excited to hear about the data there. I think what I can say is that we're certainly gonna share data on both of those trials. Uh, this year at a major medical conference, and that's been interpreted appropriately. I think we, we are comfortable saying at uh, either or <laughs> and EHA as well as ASH. So the, the question is what's going to be at ASH? I understand we're an event-driven uh, industry and company, uh, but at this point we haven't really given a lot of color as to exactly which data would we share at which meeting. Um, in past years, we've it, as you have a rolling study, it's very um, natural, of course, to, um, to to share a lot of data. But as we are now getting a cadence to the trials, we have to really think about what's the appropriate time. Certainly, if there's anything that's material, uh, we would share that immediately, even before a medical meeting. But I think at this point, we haven't really shared specifically what what 
data will be shared at what meeting. So, but I think we can f safely say that both EHA and ASH are the two primary uh, meetings where we would consider sharing data, and we will uh, this year. So I'd like to be a little more specific, but that's where the company is at this point in time. As we think about the difference between beta thalassemia and sickle, um, beta thal is an indication where it, you know, it's almost a, a point in time measure shows you that you're working. You know, you, you added four grams plus of new hemoglobin and for a beta thal patient, that's well, I mean, what, what more would you wanna see? Whereas for, for sickle, that's only part of the story because if you add four grams of new hemoglobin, you still have to show that you've prevented sickling. So how do you how do you think about kind of monitoring the patients and then and then at what point do you do you feel like you're really starting to appreciate that you've impacted the disease course and, and sickle frequency? No, it's a great question, and, and again, it's part of setting the expectations um, that we're trying to do in as measured a way as possible. Which is, you're right, the beta thalassemia is a very black and white, it's a, it's a clinician's dream. You, you can, you can, we have a biomarker for T87Q. You can see the result of that very easily, and these patients either don't make any or enough beta globin, and so the treatment is more beta globin, and you can actually see our, our, our transgene. With sickle cell, um, while we're very confident from a scientific perspective based on experiments in nature like the persistence of, uh, of fetal hemoglobin, hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin that there's, uh, you need to get sort of a baseline of at least 30% um, of uh, below fascicling, uh, fascicle um, cells, that we can uh, uh, get above that based on the beta thal data we saw. So we're very confident in that, from that perspective, it's, as you said, a more complex disease. So clinically, it's gonna take time to show the absence, for instance, of sickling events. So I think we, we're gonna to need to monitor patients for longer. So we'll certainly see data sometime this year but in, that, in the 205 patient um, that we spoke about it in December, as well as any data that we would potentially have in 206, which is our US-based sickle cell um, trial as well. Uh, but I think it will, it will take more time just based on the complexity of the disease to be able to really you know, m make a, a final determination. It's not as, as as you said, as cut and dried as beta thalassemia is. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a little higher science question. Feel free to feel free to pass. Okay. <laughs> I got Rick here too. He's my safe guy. I'm hoping you might know this. <laughs> sure. If not, I've got more questions. Okay. Um, you know, conceptually, to to think about a point in time marker for sickle efficacy, you, know, you could think about taking a patient's cells. Uh, exposing them to tight, you know, hypoxic condition and checking to see if they sickle is maybe a surrogate to see if they're at risk for a crisis. Is that something that you guys are going to be doing or able to report as kind of an early marker for success? We're certainly going to be, yes, that's, that's going to be part of, our, of what we'll study, whether that will, um, that by itself, again, is going to be enough because things ebb and flow in the disease. And the other thing is, um, you know, for, especially for uh, sickle patients that are transfusion dependent. With, with beta thalassemia, you can get to a certain level before you, uh, before you treat. You, you really don't want to trigger a crisis in a sickle cell patient. So certainly we'll do all the lab monitoring of all the results, but I just think we have to approach a sickle cell patient with a little, with a little more, uh, with a, you know, caution. Uh, the, the benefits that so far we're seeing are so pronounced. Have, have you started to think about a phase three or registration trial design? I can't imagine why you would need a placebo. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're dealing with curative uh, treatments. It is, uh, we haven't had to do that so far. But, uh, so I, I'd say again, we're having very active conversations. Our goal is to get you know, our treatment, a safe treatment to patients as quickly as possible. Um, so we're in very active uh, conversations with, uh, with the regulatory authorities, both in, in Europe and in the United States. So um, part, we have to determine what the nature of that regulatory path will be, and that's another actually milestone. I'm glad you asked the question that 
we plan to deliver this year is we will get clarity and we will share with you the clarity as we get it ourselves from the regulatory authorities about exactly uh, what we will need, what a, what a registration trial would look like, what the size of it would be, what, what kind of um, kind of at the end points would be. Um, so we're, we're in very active conversations about that. And given that we just received breakthrough status, as you probably saw in February, um, we certainly have the attention, at least on the FDA side, and certainly uh, as well with uh, the European authorities. So they're paying attention, and we're getting very quick response times, and we're having great conversations. Uh, I've given Nick a hard time, but not you on this one. So, okay. so, now, so now I get to, to push you on this. I've got your whole pipeline mapped out. Every disease that's, that's currently treated with an allogeneic bone marrow transplant is a disease you guys should think about going after. Um, at what point are you going to hit the accelerator and start rolling out these pipeline programs? So, you know, just because you've got such a modular platform that they're all going to work. I mean, you don't even need the data. I, you know, I, they're all approved. <laughs> Everything's going to work. That's right. It's not. At, at what point is the right time to, to get more aggressive yeah. with the programs and enrollment, et cetera? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. I think, um, you know, if you look at CCALD, I look at that, or maybe a, a way to think about that is, although, you know, from a commercial perspective, that's an ultra orphan indication, and you might not see, you know, um, this kind of blockbuster status, you know, you need, we need to prove the platform and prove the technology. And I think that first and has to be the first and foremost what we want, want to do. So that would be great validation of the lentiviral platform that we've, we've established and that we think we're, we're a leader in. And I think based on having some inf information like that, I think then you can start to put other, other things in the, in the clinic, so. So stay tuned still. Stay tuned still. <laughs> This time next year, Bluebird Analyst event. I know, I, I have to be the Five no Bluebird. person. I don't like to be the no person all the time, but unfortunately that's the role at times. Maybe one more question for me. If you look at the slide, you've got something yep. on the left and something on the right and something on the bottom. Is there room for something on the top? How, how, <laughs> how do you think about kind of continuing to expand capabilities in gene therapy, or do you feel like you've got kind of a full complement now for Bluebird? I think, you know, we, we, I mean, we have a horizon group. We have a, a very active business development group. But I think right now there's such fertile ground in gene therapy. As you said, there's so many things that we could do uh, with monogenic diseases um, that just the, if you take a lentiviral platform, if you take the ability to manufacture that in a larger scale, which is not trivial, <laughs> by the way. We, the company spent a lot of time over the last few years investing in that. And then you take gene editing and you apply those to both the CAR T space and gene therapy. There's, there's a lot there. That said, we've got scientists who are thinking about other things as well. And, and hopefully that's another part of Bluebird is that we continue to not just be thinking of the present, but that we, 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 we're looking ahead a little bit too. And so we're trying to do that. We'll see if there's a quick question in the audience for Jim. Got one back there. Yes. Yeah. I think we wait for the microphone, sir. Was it coming? Or if you, we okay. can repeat the question. Okay, we can repeat the question. That's fine. I think yeah. The, so the question is, uh, what safety data would we need to initiate the, the registration trials? Um, so again, that's something that's being discussed. Uh, maybe what I can talk about is the safety data that we currently share now for our, for our current trials. And the, you know, that's part of certainly the equation and factoring in what we would do for phase two and three. So um, we do a couple of things. One is we... Um, we do what's called an ISA or an insertional site analysis uh, because uh, way back when in, in the early days of gene therapy, uh, we had the risk of, uh, in, in a couple of cases, of uh, insertional meta mutagenesis. So uh, we're consistently looking at the clones that are created and make sure there's no clonal dominance. So that's certainly uh, an important part of the, the safety feature. So we do that today and um, that would certainly, I think, inform the, the future registration trials. Uh, I think um, beyond that, just that there's no, uh, and again, uh, feel very confident in this, but just, you know, sort of belts and suspenders, if you will, uh, that, that there's absolutely no replication in the, uh, in, the, in the actual vector itself. So those are two, two important safety signals that we, we look at, for instance. So how many patients and how many 
wants to follow up data on the clones do they FD wants want to see to so uh, we again it's another piece that they we, we haven't got complete clarity on yet. Uh, there was uh, proof of principle, proof of concept studies that were done at the founding of the company where you know, patients are tracked over, over, f over five years, six years, seven years. So we've, we've got quite a bit of very early data and we'll continue to monitor patients uh, you know, years past the, the end of these trials, but the exact number um, is, is TBD to be determined. Great. I think with that, uh, it's at the end of our time here. Jim, thank you so much. Always thank great you. seeing you and getting caught up on Bluebird. So yeah. Thanks, everyone. We're going to start our next uh, company in just one second.